We're glad to have you here. This is our first night of revival. We're going to be meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. That's Monday night, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're really glad to have the evangelists that we do for this spring revival. He told me that his members call him Herschel. They call him Herschel York. They call him Pastor. His students call him Dr. York. So you pick something out of that that you might want. But I, I saw his eyes light up when he began to talk about his grandkids. I can tell he likes Grandpa better than any other title that he's got. We're really glad Dr. York is here with us, and we want to make him feel welcome. Join me, if you will, in welcoming him here. Well, I'm really, really happy to be with you tonight. Uh, I, I thought I was coming to a Baptist church, but you guys are sitting toward the front of the sanctuary. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, where I've uh, happened in, but... Uh, I will, I, I will uh, be happy to preach to you wherever you're sitting. I'm just glad to uh, be with you tonight. It's good to see some folks. I know there are even some Buck Run folks that have come down. They are, really are gluttons for punishment, aren't they? Uh, so I'm glad to the Bullocks and uh, Christy for coming down. And my wife, Tanya, is with me. Uh, she came just to make sure that I don't uh, say anything about her that she doesn't approve of. But... <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I hope that you get acquainted with her. I'm, I'm looking forward to each night, and uh, there's, I'm probably going to preach each night out of the book of 2 Corinthians. I, I am enamored with this book. I, I love this book. If you would turn to 2 Corinthians, we're going to begin in chapter 3. The thing about uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's, it's uh, one of those books in the New Testament that we, we don't refer to a lot. It uh, doesn't, it's not usually quoted as much as 1 Corinthians or some of Paul's others, other epistles. The thing about uh, 2 Corinthians, we know that it is at least the fourth letter that Paul wrote to this one church. The church at Corinth seemed to be like his problem child. Uh, we know that he, of course, we know of 1 Corinthians, but really in first, the first book of the epistle to the to the Corinthians, the first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul mentions an earlier letter he wrote to them. And then in 2 Corinthians, he mentions a letter that he wrote to them between the two. He calls it his severe letter. So if he wrote at least four letters to this one church in a pretty small amount of time, it, it, it tells me that they had a lot of problems. Now Paul had planted this church. Paul had spent 18 months in Corinth. And while there in Corinth, he had preached the gospel to them. He he, his life was in jeopardy at one point, but still he was faithful. He preached to them there in the synagogue, and God blessed, and many of them came to faith in Christ, were baptized, this church was planted, and uh, then Paul went away. And now, uh, through the years, uh, they have begun, you know, they've had this relationship with Paul, but man, they've had a lot of problems in the church. We, you know that from the first epistle to the Corinthians, uh, everything from uh, from a guy sleeping with his, his father's you know, a wife to suing one another to getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and they didn't understand marriage and divorce and remarriage and speaking in tongues. You, you name it. This church had all kinds of problems. This is, the, this is a church that no pastor would willingly go and, pa and, and serve. Uh, they, they were just trouble. But Paul stuck with them. And he just keeps writing them, and he, he, he stays engaged with them. But now something has happened. There have come into the church at Corinth there some really slick guys. I mean, they are great speakers. They have great education. Uh, they, they sort of entice the people away from Paul. And the thing is, you know, nobody comes in wearing a sign that says false teacher. Everybody that comes in, you know, everyone that preaches claims to be preaching the truth and they sort of sound right. Maybe they have a smile on their face. They're very engaging. Uh, maybe they tell funny stories. You, you, you like these guys. The problem is that what they are preaching is close to the gospel. But remember this, anything that's close to the gospel is not the gospel. I mean, the gospel is very narrowly defined. The gospel centers around the atoning work of Jesus Christ 
that he died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he died for us, and that anyone who believes in him in repentance and faith can be cleansed of their sins and have a, the guarantee of a place in heaven. That is the gospel. What these guys came in preaching sounded something very similar to that, but it wasn't the gospel. And, and frankly, Paul is he's mad. He's hurt. He's incensed. He's troubled because he's invested so much in these people. They know him, and yet here they are being drawn away by someone who's just slicker than he is. Maybe they're smarter than he is. Maybe they have a more impressive resume than he does. And so, though he begins nice enough in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in fact, his prose, his writing is very lofty. It, it sounds beautiful. Back in chapter 1, he, he begins, blessed be God, even the, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our trouble, so that we can comfort others with the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now that, that sounds nice, but the, the more he writes, it's like the matter he gets. In fact, liberal scholars have attacked what's called the unity of 2 Corinthians. They've said, well, this isn't just one letter of Paul, this is different pieces of different letters, because, you know, in, in chapter 2 and 3, he starts to get mad, and the more he writes, he gets madder until he gets to chapter 8 and 9, and then suddenly he changes subjects, he's talking about taking up a, a collection for the poor. And then in chapter 10, he's mad all over again, and he's madder than he's ever been. In chapter 10 and 11, his pen drips with sarcasm, and it's stinging and biting. And these liberal scholars say this can't be one letter because of the way it goes back and forth between anger and, and sort of being nice and then anger again. Now, I, here's what I say. These liberal scholars clearly have never had any children. <laughs> because I think every parent gets that. Don't you? I mean, how many times have you just been so upset with your kids and you're just really giving it to them and you realize, I, I can't be this uptight. I've got to back it down. This is not how you teach your kids. And so you back it down and, and you calm things down. And then you remember what you're mad about and you get mad all over again. I get it. Paul is there. And so we're going to take a look at, and just sort of see how he is pressing them on what is the gospel and how they've been led astray. And I think there are, there are really three things that we can wrap, uh, sort of we can summarize the themes. And, and for the first three nights, I want to talk about these three words, these three things. And then on the fourth night, it's sort of the culmination. We're going to jump all the way over to, to uh, chapter, uh, chapter 12, and we're going to talk about really what I think is really the peak of the book. But at Buck Run, where I pastor, we, we, we have devised a, a church, uh, a, a purpose statement, a mission statement. And here's Here's the way it goes. We glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ in order to make disciples who serve their community and spread the gospel to the nations. Now, I know as a Baptist pastor that everybody in my church isn't going to memorize that. So we boiled it down to three words. And we want everybody to think of these three words, proclaim, disciple, and serve. Proclaim, disciple, and serve. And those are the three words we want to look at in, in, in 2 Corinthians, and, and though these words themselves don't always appear, it's, it's definitely the theme of what Paul is saying. And so tonight, beginning in chapter 3, verse 7, I'd like to read to you a, a passage uh, where Paul talks about what it is that we proclaim. Now, 2 Corinthians, I think, is one of the most beautifully written books of Paul's. And you'll notice he has lots of pairs. He, he, he pairs things up. Sometimes they are Synonyms, sometimes they are opposites, they're contrast, but he, he's, he's taking the theme, basically he's showing to them that there's a choice before them and that they, they've got to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel. Read with me beginning in verse 7. He's talking here about the, the ministry that God has given us. We are ministers of a new covenant. And he ends there in verse 6, he says, we're ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now contrasting, remember, here's the first pair, 
the old covenant and the new covenant. And contrasting these two things, he says, Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory. Now, you might want to circle that word. Notice how many times Paul uses this word glory. If, if that, that ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, see that right there? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the law, the Ten Commandments. It, and he calls it the ministry of death. Because what does he say in Romans? That the, the law kills. The law is what slays us. The law is what makes us see that we are sinners. It, it drives us to the end of ourselves. And we realize that we're dead in trespasses and sin. And here's what he says about the law. He says, now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not, might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory into another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is, is hidden, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In this case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who, sh who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now this is an incredible passage. And I just want to walk through it because here he's talking about what it is we proclaim. You've got to ask yourself, why do we exist? Why is our church here? What, what's our purpose? What is our mission? And uh, what is it that we proclaim? And make no mistake about it, we don't proclaim our message. You know, there's a lot of hand-wringing going on in churches these days. Our culture is changing and it's changing rapidly right before our eyes. Who thought, even five, ten years ago, that we'd be debating the things that are being openly discussed and debated these days. I mean, who dreamed of that? Uh, I, I, I have seen things in my lifetime. I've had to deal with things in my lifetime. That My father, who was a pastor for, for uh, several decades before he died five years ago, my, my dad didn't dream of seeing some of these things. I mean, who thought 20 years ago we'd be even debating gay marriage. Something that's never taken place in the history of the world in any culture. 
let alone in a culture that sort of calls itself uh, a Christian nation. But here we are. There's a lot of hand-wringing about that. Churches are, how do we respond? What do we do? Well, here's what we do. We do what God's commanded us to do from the time Jesus built his church during his earthly ministry. We proclaim the word of God. Our, our concern cannot be the reaction or response of the world. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it. This nation has been an anomaly anyway. There are a lot of nations in the world today where if a person professes their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and if they're baptized, it's equivalent to a death sentence. So we've had it pretty easy in our, in our nation. And now God's allowing us to see a little bit of difficulty. So we're being marginalized. We're being pushed aside. We're being called bigots and old-fashioned and whatever you want to say. The question is, are we going to change our message to be more comfortable? And the answer is, we've got to proclaim what the church has been proclaiming since Jesus Christ was here 2,000 years ago. Look what he says. The, the ministry that we have, we, we're simply proclaiming what we have been given. And what we've been given is something even better than the law. We proclaim, first of all, he says, the ministry of the Spirit, not the ministry of death. The first contrast he gives us here, he talks about the ministry of death, and he characterizes the law that way, because the law is what slayed us. Remember Paul said that he used to pride himself on having kept the commandments until he got to that tenth one. Thou shalt not covet. And he could tick the other ones off, well I've done this, I've done that. And all those things are outward actions. But when he got to thou shalt not covet, that's not something you do, that's something you feel. And Paul said that one killed me. That's what the law does. It slays us. It brings us to the end of ourselves. Because, you know, there's a lot of things up there maybe I can say I've never done. I've never killed anybody. But there's, not, there's really nothing up there I can say I haven't wanted to. And it shows the wickedness of my heart. That's the ministry of death. But what he's given us is the ministry of the Spirit, which makes alive. It's the ministry of righteousness, not the ministry of condemnation. The law cannot make anyone righteous. You can't be saved by the law. The only way you can be saved by the law would be to keep it perfectly. And the reality is by the time you know the law, you've already broken it. And so what we need is a righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. And what Paul says here, he says, now, I want you to see the difference in these two. He calls the, the ministry of the law, the ministry of death, he said it had a fading glory. But the ministry of the spirit has an unfading glory. What's he talking about? Well, you remember the story in the book of Exodus when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the law. Forty days he's up there with God alone on Mount Sinai. And you remember what happened to his face? His face began to shine so brightly. Moses didn't even realize it. And when he came down off the mountain, it says that his face was shining. And Moses put a veil over it. Now, I will tell you, here's one of the things I think that people misunderstand about the motive. You'll hear sometimes preachers like myself say, Moses put, his face was shining so brightly that people couldn't look at him, and so he put a veil over his face so people could look at him. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says that Moses knew that his, the glory of his face was fading. And he didn't want people to know that it was fading. It was a fading glory. In fact, you read in the book of Exodus that that would begin to fade, and Moses would then go into the, the tabernacle and meet there with God and so his face would begin to shine. He would take the veil off when he went in there to meet with God and then when he came out, he would come out, let them see that his face was shining and he'd put the veil over again. And the picture here is that he says, now look, the law has a glory. He says the law is glorious. It was written by the hand of God itself. There is a glory of the law but he says it's a fading glory. And you know it would, be, it would be foolish for any of us to ever envy Moses. You know, there's something in us. We, we read the account of Moses up on Sinai. Remember he said, Lord, show me your glory. And it's really one of the, it's one of the strangest exchanges in all of the Bible. You remember what God said? He said, Moses, if I showed you my glory, it would kill you. You, you can't take my glory. And then he says this. 
He said, Moses, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cause my goodness to pass before you. And he says, I will show you. And, and the King James, I think, is translated this way. I will show you my hinder part. Literally in Hebrew it says, I'll show you my backside. Isn't that a strange thing? I was in Israel one time and uh, in a Palestinian restaurant and my guide was a Jew and we went in and there was a big Palestinian, a PLO flag hanging up on the wall and I watched as my guide positioned himself at the table with his back to that flag. And I said, Zvi, you see that flag on the wall? He said, yes, I show it my backside. He didn't like what that Palestinian flag represented. And so he, sh he showed it his backside. It was his way of saying, uh, I I I I'm not going to show up my face. I'm going to show up my backside, which is considered an insult. Now, when God says this to Moses, he's not insulting Moses. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, Moses, I'm going to show you the least glorious part of me, and it's still going to be all you can handle. It will nearly kill you. And God's glory is so great that the least little bit of it caused Moses' face to shine, but it was a fading glory. But you and I don't need to envy Moses. There should be nothing in us that says, boy, I wish I could be like Moses. I wish God would hide me in the cleft of the rock and cause his glory to pass by because you and I have something far, far better. What does John say in John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. Down in verse 14, and we beheld his what? His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of God's glory, and it is a glory that will not fade. If you could keep the law for one single day of your life, there's something glorious about that, but it's a fading glory. You can't sustain it. You can't be good enough. You can't keep the law enough. The law can only kill you. It's the ministry of death. But when you come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, what Jesus does for you is that he gives you life. He gives you a righteousness of his own. And it's a righteousness that does not fade. You did nothing to earn it. You do nothing to sustain it. You do nothing to keep it. You do nothing to deserve it because it's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. Man, that's what I need. The, the glory that Moses had on his face was a glory that faded, and he knew it. But the glory that I have in Jesus Christ will never fade. It's not my glory. It's the glory of the righteousness of Christ. And you know what? It's, it's a, a glory of freedom. Look at verse 17. He says, now verse 16, back up. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. He says, this is what salvation is. It's God taking off the veil so that we see the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Man, there's bondage in the law. Sometimes Christians begin to think that, that what Christianity is is keeping a bunch of rules and regulations and ticking things off. I do this, I don't do this, I go here, I don't go there, I wear this, I don't wear that. And while there might be wisdom in some of those things, there's no glory in any of those things. Can I, can I be just real candid with you? I grew up, I mean, you talk about legalistic, man. The church I grew up in, you guys would already be called liberals just because you've got that thing in here. Church I grew up in, missionaries couldn't even show slides in. That was considered worldly entertainment. I can remember when my dad brought it up to install air conditioning in the church building that men stood up and opposed it because they said that is worldly enticement to get people to come to church. And my dad said, then let's take out the furnace. <laughs> let's make them cold in the winter too while we're at it. And we got the air conditioner. But it was a, it was, it was a major controversy. And, uh, I mean, there's so many things. We, we only had uh, church dinners in warm weather because you had to eat outside. And, and, and farmers would bring their wagons for us to eat outside because you couldn't eat inside. And, and you know what? Uh, uh, 
I never saw my mother wear pants. My sisters, we'd go sledding in the winter. My sisters had to wear dress, had to wear dresses. And you know, I mean, I grew up way out in the country, and yeah, had some big old gals. Loved to play softball at church picnics, but of course, they had to wear dresses. I'm just being real candid here. I saw more women's underwear sliding in the second base at a church picnic. <laughs> in the name of modesty. In the name of modesty. Now, I'm all for a woman looking like a woman. But, you know, the, the point ought to be modesty. The point ought not be some artificial article of clothing that didn't even exist when the Bible was written. You understand? And I believe in Christian standards. There's a, there's a way that our standards reflect the character of Christ. But we do it out of love for Christ and desire to be like him. We don't do it to earn God's favor. We don't do it to earn his love. We don't do it for that fading glory that we can't sustain. Our hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And it's a, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's freedom. It's a freedom not to sin but a freedom to act out of love for Christ, not out of fear of death and disappointing God. It's a, it's a transformation. In verse 18, he says, that we all with this unveiled face, because the Spirit has removed the veil from us so that we see the light of the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ, he's transforming us. We're being transformed, beholding the glory of the Lord. We're transformed into the same image from one glory to another. As we see the glory of God, as we see the glory of God in Jesus Christ, we want to become like him. We grow in holiness, not out of a sense of duty, but out of love. You know, my wife Tanya is here, and I will tell you, we are, we are blessed. We, just, we enjoy one another. We love one another. And, man, I, I am grateful. 33 years of marriage. I, I, I just can't tell you the absolute delight and joy we have. If I walked around every day saying... I, I, I can only be with one woman. I, I, I can just be with one woman. All the other women in the world, I, I, I'm just stuck with one. But how, do, how do you think that would affect my behavior? If that's the way I looked at it, do you think that that would make me want to sin or want to be holy? But I'll tell you this, because I love her, I say, Wow. I get to be with her. So here's the thing. You'll always move toward whatever you focus on. And if your focus is on what I must not do, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, oh, don't do that, don't do, you know what you do? The more you tell yourself, oh, don't do that, don't do that, you must not do that, the more you move toward it, the more you desire to do it. But if your focus is on Christ, oh, I love my Savior, I want to be like my Savior, you'll move toward him. A lot of times things that masquerade as Christianity is really, it's still the ministry of death. And the more we say, thou shalt not, the more our flesh says, I want to do that. But when we focus on Christ and on his glory, we're transformed from glory, one glory to another. What a beautiful thing that God has done that for us. You become like what you worship. If you worship Christ, you become like him. So he says here, we, we must proclaim what we've been given. Then in, as he moves into chapter 4, he says, we must not lose heart. See, the, the law makes us lose heart because I can never measure up. I, I can never be good enough. My, my, my thoughts can't be pure enough. I, I can't even believe enough. If it's about what I do enough, I'll lose heart. But look what Paul says. Because he's given us this ministry of the new covenant. It's a ministry of life, not the ministry of death. It, it, it is the ministry of a glory that is unfading instead of the ministry of a glory that is fading. He says, therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. All right, look what he says. First of all, we renounce deceit. As proclaimers of the word of God, it's important 
that we just put it right out there, what we believe. To me, it's a, it's a shame and a disgrace. Sometimes you go to certain churches, you can't figure out what they believe. I knew a pastor one time that whenever anybody would ask him, now, pastor, what do you believe about such and such? He'd put his arm around their shoulders. He'd go, well, what do you think? And he'd never give an answer. And therefore, in his church, there were people that held ex- totally opposite views on just about everything under the sun because there was no definition of what they believed. The, the Bible's clear. Paul says, we, we renounce deceit and we refuse dilution. He said, we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. He, he says, all right, we renounce deceit. We refuse dilution. That is, we refuse to tamper with the word of God. We're not trying to change it. It, it is, frankly, stunning to me what people are doing today with the word of God in order to bend it and twist it and make it fit what the world wants it to say. Uh, and, you know, when, when the Pharisees came to Jesus asking him about divorce, What was Jesus' hermeneutic? How did he answer them? He said, well, let's just go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. In that statement, Jesus defined how many are in the marriage. He defined the the sex of those in the marriage. He defined the length, the duration of the marriage. Now, I... I, don't just, I just don't see how you can change that. That's what it says. You, you may not like it. You may say it's out of step. I, you're free to say you don't believe it. But by all means, don't claim that it says what it does not say. It clearly says what it says. The Bible is clear in this point. One of the great doctrines of the Reformers was called the perspicuity of Scripture, which simply means that A person can read the Bible and understand its basic meaning. The Bible says we're all sinners. The Bible says that we all deserve hell. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty, to pay for the sins of anyone who would believe on him, repenting of their sins, putting their faith and trust in him. That's clear to anyone who reads the Bible. We're not free to change that. We reveal this truth in this open statement of truth. Openly to people, he says, we say it in the, in, in the, before the conscience of men and then in the sight of God. Notice we have a twofold audience when we proclaim the truth. We're proclaiming it so people hear it and understand it. But we are always aware that God listens in, that we represent him when we open this book and we proclaim his word, and that we have to represent it accurately. Let me put it like this. Either... You are over this text, or this text is over you. Either you sit in judgment on the Bible, or the Bible sits in judgment on you. You need to decide which one it is. I was one time on an airplane, and a lady began talking to me. She was, I'm trying to remember this correctly. She was a a member of the Baha'i faith. She was a psychologist, psychologist. from California, and she'd been married five times. And we began talking, and she said to me, she said, you know, and she said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a Baptist preacher. Oh, this lit her up. She said, Baptist, you're one of those, like, are you a Southern Baptist? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those. She's one of those that believes, like, women should submit to men. I said, no, no, no. We don't believe women should submit to men. We believe a wife should submit to her husband. Big difference. Oh, and she, she was just, you know, this, this, this really irked her. She thought that was something. And, of course, everything in me wanted to say, lady, you're the one who's been married five times. <laughs> I, I thought it. I did not say it. I did not say it. But I did find it ironic. Finally, she said to me, she said, and she said, and you believe there's just one way to heaven? I said, I do. And I, I quickly ran through the gospel with her. She said, you know what? To think that there's just one way for a person to go to heaven? She said, that just is so arrogant. I said, you know, I I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to get you upset. But I said, can I just have the freedom to respond to that? Would you allow me that privilege? She said, sure. I said, you know, 
For the life of me, I don't get that. I just don't understand that. I said, because here's the way I see it. What I am saying is that there's nothing in me smart enough or good enough to know the way of eternal life. That I must completely surrender myself to an external source. And that external source is the Bible. And I, I say, whatever the Bible says is what I say. Whatever it says do, I want to do. Whatever it says believe, I want to believe. I, 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 I'm completely surrendered to this book. I said, you on the other hand, I said, you think you know the way of eternal life simply because it's what you believe, right? He said, well, yeah. I said, so you, there are parts of the Bible you consider valid and parts you don't. Isn't that right? She said, yeah. I said, now, isn't that amazing? You sit in judgment on the Bible. You set yourself up as the arbiter of truth, and yet you say, I'm the one who's arrogant. I said, forgive me, I just don't, I don't get that. And I'm telling you, there was a look on her face like that thought had simply never even occurred to her. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm not free to change what the Bible says. I'm not free to treat it like a buffet where I pick and choose the things I want and leave the things I don't. I, I believe it's all the word of God. This is, Paul is so clear about this that we, he says we can't lose hope we can't lose sight of this, that we have to have the open statement of the truth. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And what he's saying here is that we must not accept a responsibility that is not ours. I am not responsible to save. I am responsible to preach. Look what he says. Even if our gospel is, is veiled, even if our gospel is hidden to some, it's not hidden because we're not saying it openly. It's not hidden because we're not being, being completely honest about it. If our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Look at that. He says, even if we openly proclaim the gospel, there are going to be some to whom that gospel remains hidden. And the reason is that as we preach, as we proclaim, as we witness, as we share, there is an unseen spiritual battle that is happening. That Satan, the God of this world, is busily engaged in blinding their minds. He does not want them to see the light of the gospel. And so he's giving them false teachers, those who say something that is close to the gospel. Man, it grieves me. Will you forgive me in advance? You know, if I get you upset, it's okay. I'm leaving. And anyway, so, you know. Man, when Baptists come to me, people who've sat in churches and heard the gospel preached, and they go, Oh, don't you just love Joel Osteen? Well, if by that you mean, do I think Joel Osteen is sincere? Is he a nice guy? Does he want good things? I'm sure all that's true. But I will tell you, when someone says that they simply will not talk about sin in their church, then they cannot be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just impossible to preach the gospel because Jesus didn't come to save us from bad circumstances. He came to save his people from their sin. You, you can't preach the gospel without mentioning sin. And when people say, oh man, I, I like it because, you know, he's so positive. Well, it's great to be positive when there's something to be positive about. But you can't get someone saved until first you get them lost. And man, I, I watch Osteen sometimes, and he, boy, what he says is so close to the gospel. It has the, the ring of truth about it. It has a truthiness. It, it sounds close. I mean, he's not getting up and encouraging people to worship Satan. What he says sounds good. And you know what? There are people all across this country just like him. They're, they don't want to offend 
But folks, I'll tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ is inherently offensive. The cross of Christ is offensive because what it says is you can't save yourself. And I just like to sort of think that I had something to do with my salvation. My flesh wants to feel like it accomplished something. And the gospel says you can accomplish nothing. That's offensive to me. It's offensive to me that a, that a, that a parent would punish his child for something somebody else did. That's inherently offensive. But that is exactly what a holy God did. He poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ. We don't like to think that God hates sin so much that he really would condemn a world to hell. That's offensive. But that's part of the gospel. Paul makes it clear that when we preach the gospel, there are some that they will not, they can't handle that because the God of this world has blinded their minds but we proclaim this truth openly because there's a spiritual battle. While we're seeking to display Christ, Satan is seeking to blind them. But we can't lose sight of our help. He, he says, it's the, the gospel of the glory of Christ who's the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We're, we're just his servants for Jesus' sake. One of these days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to write a book on pastoring. I'm going to call it The Accidental Pastor. Because here's what I've learned. Is the vast majority of the great stuff that happens at Buck Run happens completely independently of me and my staff coming up with the plan. You know, we do our best to come up with great plans, but our programs, our plans, even sometimes when they're well executed, they... They really don't do what we want them to do. But you know, I'll tell you what, what happens. Stuff like two years ago, right before Christmas, the McDonald's on the east side of Frankfurt burned down. And it was the Sunday, we had, it was the second Sunday before Christmas, and the next Sunday we were taking up our big missions offering, our Lottie Moon missions offering that Southern Baptists collect. And Man, I've really been pushing our church. We wanted to have like a, a fifty or $60,000 missions offering. And that, I'm asking people to dig deep to give to that. And the Sunday before we take up that offering, between the two services, one of my deacons comes in my office. He says, uh, I, I think we need to do something for those workers at that McDonald's. And I said, uh, well, you know, Tim, that's great. But uh, you're talking about... Like taking up an offer or something? Yeah, he said, you know, they, they've served us and most of them are Hispanic and they live on minimum wage. Christmas is coming. They don't have anything for their families. We need to do something to help them. I said, well, you know, we've got our, that Lottie Moon offering coming up next week and well, I, I don't want to really ask our missionaries to pay the price for our people to, you know, I don't want them dividing their offering. And, and my, my deacon looked at me and said, Pastor, if you ask people to not cut into what they've purposed in their hearts to give to missions, and you ask them instead to cut into what they're going to spend on Christmas for themselves and their families, they'll do it because you ask. He said, and if you ask, my wife and I'll give the first $2,000. I hate it when my deacons are more spiritual than I am. It's, a, <laughs> it's an inconvenience, I'll tell you. All right, well... Okay, so we just put out a call that week to our people Sunday. Not only are we going to take up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for missions, we're going to take up an offering for the McDonald's workers. I'm asking you, don't cut into your missions offering to give to them. Cut into your own Christmas. Bless people who don't really have much. And so that Sunday morning, we took up a $60,000 offering for missions and a $10,000 offering for those McDonald's workers. And that night, instead of having Sunday night service, we had a banquet for all of them and their families. And we spent what we needed on the food and we had enough left over to give every employee of that McDonald's $150 in gift cards from Walmart and Kroger so they could get something for their families for Christmas. Most of them there were Hispanic. I had one of my deacons who's from Puerto Rico translate. We explained to them we... We are doing this because Jesus gave himself for us and we, we want to bless you the way Jesus blessed us and presented the gospel. 
I saw a lot of those workers in there just tears streaming down their face. One old guy tatted up all over, comes up to me after he said, you know what, I'm probably still never going to go to church, but if I ever do, it'll be this one. I'm okay with that. You know? Uh, who knows when the Holy Spirit will wake him up in the pig pen of life and say, go home. And he'll come to Buck Run. The very next week, after Christmas, New Year's Eve, early that morning, a Hispanic man and his wife got up and he was going to take her to work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And they got in the parking lot of their apartment building. There were three men waiting there with a gun. They put it in his ribs and they shot him right in the gut. And they took her out of the country and they raped her and left her completely naked, took her clothes. Six o'clock in the morning, she has to go to some farmhouse out there and knock on the door and she speaks no English. And she communicates to them what's happened. They cover her up. The police get to the man. They take him to the UK hospital where he's in a coma for 10 days. That was in the papers on January the 2nd. They didn't give their names because of the nature of the crime, but a lady in our church reading that article, it described where they worked. She worked at McDonald's. He worked at Buffalo Trace Distillery. And reading that, she said, they were at our banquet last Sunday night. I ate with them. I know who this is. And Debbie just took it on herself to basically go to the UK hospital and cause them to violate every HEPA law in the book and tell her where they were. And she goes in. She speaks no Spanish. Mata speaks no English. But Debbie basically tells her, I'm here to just take over your life. And she communicates to her her love. And she brought her to church the very next Sunday. I watched 30, 40 women in our church gather around her and pray down front. And she, she looked so stunned and dazed. Without telling you every detail of the story, I want you to know that not only were they saved as a result of that, but if you come to Buck Run now, as a direct result of that McDonald's dinner and ministering to that couple, by the way, Selwyn lived, they, they weren't married. We married them. We baptized them. Today at Buck Run, there were probably 30 Hispanics in our balcony wearing headsets, listening to a live simultaneous translation of the service while I preached. All of it came right out of that. We didn't plan that. No one figured out, hey, let's, let's implement this strategy to reach the Hispanics. God just did it. How did he do it? By proclaiming the word openly, our people caught what the gospel is about and the Holy Spirit of God lifted veils from the hearts of minds that had been darkened. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. You see, we can't fail to pray. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, you don't go and rob a strong man until you first bind him. That's what this is what Paul is talking about. Satan is the strong man. And you and I can bind him by praying. We pray. We seek the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, if you don't remove the veil, it won't be moved. If you don't illumine minds and hearts, they won't see. We preach the gospel. And we beg God to open their minds so that they see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ far more brilliantly than any Israelite saw the shining face of Moses. We pray, we proclaim him. We don't preach ourself. We don't preach self-fulfillment. We don't say that our goal is to make your life easier or better. That's what these false teachers that were so close to the gospel, they, they made it about you making your life better. Paul said, no, you follow Christ. He was a crucified savior. What happened to him might happen to you. But eternity awaits. And we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord. We, we don't shine. We ask the light of the glory of Christ to shine. Because we only see God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. He, is the, he, he has exegeted God. He has revealed God to this world. And we see Christ in Scripture. 
And so we've got to proclaim him. He's the one whom we proclaim. Today, you either behold his glory or you behold the blindness of your own sin. If you're a believer tonight, I, I want to encourage your heart. Listen, there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't need to fear what's happening in our culture. We don't need to fear being marginalized. It simply doesn't matter. We have one message that we preach. It's the gospel. And the Holy Spirit of God takes the gospel that we proclaim. Man, he, he changes lives. He lifts the veil. He reveals the glory of Christ. And lives are changed as a result. But if you're here tonight, and you've never trusted Christ. You know, I'm not asking you to put your faith and trust in Christ because it'll make your problems instantly go away. You know, the reality is the problems you have as an unbeliever will probably still be the problems you have as a believer. But there's a difference. As a believer, you have a helper that will not go away. You have a glory that will not fade. You have a, a hope and a future that you cannot lose. You see, this life on this earth is just a drop in the vast unending ocean of eternity. But it's important because it's the decision that we make in this life that determines that future. And tonight, if, if you've never trusted Christ, I'm not pointing you to Herschel York. I'm not pointing you to Brother State. And I'm not pointing you to the Bible Baptist Church. I'm pointing you to Jesus. And Jesus went to Calvary's cross, laying aside his glory so that he might pay the penalty of our sins so that he'll share that glory with us in salvation. Would you just bow your head right now? Every head bowed, every eye closed, every heart open before God. If you're a believer tonight, I, I want to ask you do, you, do you have genuine confidence in the power of the gospel? We don't need to be deceitful about it. We dare not water it down. We don't change it. We just need to proclaim it. Believe it. Live it. And are you trusting in what Christ alone has done for you? Oh, that tonight, if you're a believer, you might have such a, a heart and a passion to share the gospel with others because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. And tonight, God reminded you once again of the power of that gospel and your need to share it, your need to live it, your need to believe it every day. But I have no doubt that there are some here tonight that if, if your life were to end right now, you do not have the assurance, the confidence that you'd go to heaven to be with Christ. Because there's never been a time you've repented and believed. You know what my prayer is tonight? That even now, the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your heart and your life and that veil is being lifted off of your mind so that you see the love of Christ so great that he died for you. You see that the only way you can be saved, not by being good enough, keeping the law enough, the only way you can be saved is by resting in what Christ did for you. And his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And tonight my prayer is that you see the glory that will not fade in the gospel of Christ. In a moment when we sing, after I pray, if God has spoken to your heart in any way, your pastors who know you, who love you, are going to be standing here 
my invitation to you is very simple. It's just do what God tells you to do. Father, I pray that right now your Holy Spirit will be working, that believers will be encouraged to just trust in your plan to share the glorious gospel, to commend it before every person's conscience in the sight of God. And my prayer is that if there's someone here that has not trusted Christ, that even now your spirit will be working, showing them the love of Christ revealed on Calvary's cross and in his resurrection from the dead. And I pray that they'll respond by a public profession of faith. I pray that even now, your glory will be revealed through Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Ah! Uh -huh.